Okay, that's good because no one needed to listen to a patter about Southern Arizona. Well, you may uh, us listen to it. <laughs> What's that? <laughs> you may us listen to it. <laughs> I did make you listen to it. That's true. But that's the penalty for getting on the call at the beginning. Um, yeah, for being for being here on time. For being here on time, exactly. So I see um, we've got. Uh, Dave Egadal, Dennis Correa, Peter Kapka, Ron Shaheen, Jake Hannum, anybody else? <coughs> no? Okay. Um, this one caller, I don't know who it is, but um, you're welcome to listen in, and if you feel comfortable at any point identifying yourself, please do and participate. If not, Keep coming back until you're until you're comfortable. We we welcome everybody and um, uh, we recognize that some people would rather audit than than identify, and that's just fine. So to begin with, we got a small group. I always like a small group, um, and we have one new gentleman, Dave Egadal. Um, Dave has been talking to John Shane in um, Connecticut, and um, that's how I was introduced to him. And um, he's trying to figure out where to go now, as he's starting to see some some recurrence of his of his cancer. Um, Dave, if you're comfortable and you would uh, like to tell the guys who are on the call right now about your situation and if you've got any questions, then um, we would like to kick off with you. We usually like to give people who have never called in before uh, a generous chunk of time on their first call. All right. Yeah, I'm, uh, I'm driving and sometimes in the middle of nowhere I don't get the best cell phone service, so it might break up a little bit, but I'm assuming if I get dropped, I can call back? Anytime. Anytime. Right. We won't be dropping. It wasn't All right. So uh, it's not reoccurring. This is my uh, first bout. I was diagnosed uh, Christmas time with a PSA of 60, a Gleason of 8 to 9, and test after test. First the tests were clear, then they did the mother tests, came back that there is one spot on one of my vertebrae right near the prostate. So I had an orchectomy, kind of looked in the side effects of both the Lupron and the orchectomy and decided to go with the orchectomy not being sexually active still, so it didn't matter a whole lot there. Um, and that happened in the end of February. I just had another PSA, which was down to 0 0.9. So now Mayo says they want to uh, do proton therapy for five and a half weeks. That seems to me a better way to go than the original radiation they were talking about, but Still not sure. Yeah, I guess I'd like to get opinions on what everybody else thinks. But that's. I don't understand if this tumor is still there or if it's if the cancer with its lack of testosterone. I'm, it sounds like it won't all die off, but a lot of it will, and I don't really understand that part either. Okay. Anything else you'd like to add before we? We comment and no, oh, not at this point. That's kind of where I'm at, I guess. Short and sweet. Okay. Um. So this whole concept of debulking, uh, this whole concept of debulking the tumor is um. I'm just going to, I'm just going to, uh, I'm just going to mute you for a second, Peter. I'm getting a lot of background noise. I'll, we'll, I'll open it up to you again in a second. Um, 
this whole concept about debulking the tumor uh, is something that's relatively new, except not to Mayo. Mayo has always treated metastasized cancer with primary treatment to the prostate, usually with surgery. Um, and there's a recent study that um, may, that Memorial Sloan Kettering did, but with a small group, I think around 20 people, where they also um, treated these men with uh, uh, chemotherapy at the same time, um, giving them, debulking their tumor with, with, with um, surgery and starting them on hormone therapy. And um, now we see more and more institutions that are doing that. And we've had guys on our call um, recently who have um, chosen that way to go. So, for example, Dr. Steve, who isn't on the call today, um, is or has done chemotherapy. Was he was. He was diagnosed with a, with a PSA of 1,000, and he did chemotherapy, and then he chose to debulk his tumor with SBRT, which is comparable to the proton beam that you're looking at, and he's had very good results. He's driven his uh, PSA down to around 8. And by the way, guys, I should tell you that um, Dave's PSA was uh, 63 when um, when he was diagnosed. Um, so, it probably is not a bad move to debulk the tumor. Uh, traditionally, it hasn't been done because they've always felt that um, the side effects were worse than the benefits. But, um, if you're willing to tolerate whatever side effects you might incur from that primary treatment, then from a cancer standpoint or managing the cancer standpoint, it could be a good thing to do. Now, you mentioned about, well, what exactly is there now that my PSA um, has been driven down to, uh, to 0.9. Um, yep. Hard to say. It, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to say exactly um what um what is there and i'll give you an example uh when they um when they biopsy uh dr steve's tumor they couldn't find any cancer and yet we he still had plenty of metastasis so oh. how um, how the um, which tumors respond to the androgen deprivation therapy and how quickly they respond, I don't think we know. Uh, right. At the same time, we do know that there's a response and and we do know from uh, managing other cancers that it probably makes sense to get the cancer out if it's not already there. Now, you could, of course, have some screening done on your prostate before you start to make sure that the metastasis hasn't disappeared in your, in your um, prostate. Did you, have, did you have a biopsy or did they not biopsy you originally? Well, they biopsied me. I was biopsied. I had eights and nines. How many cores? How, how many cores did they take, and how many cores were positive, Dave? I'm not sure. I think they took eight samples. Mhm. Mm mhm. Mm and do you know? Um, do you remember how they did the biopsy? Was it with a was it with an MRI? Uh, was it a fusion biopsy, or was it just a, an ultrasound? Um, an ultrasound. Transrectal. Was it just with a probe, and and uh, yep. 
Yeah, okay. The probe and the needle probe or the needle biopsy. Yeah. So, you know, it, it, it probably would um, <clears throat> would make some sense. I don't know, but it might make some sense to, um, to do an MRI before you started just to make sure that the driving down hasn't, hasn't removed all the tumors. Um, could do. Uh, I can't really. We we don't know. So well, I have. They did. They did two MRIs and they did an experimental choline PET scan MRI. Okay. Oh, so they did do. Now I, they do have a they do have a simulation scheduled, which is another MRI, and I was kind of thinking maybe that would show if it was had disappeared or not. I don't know. I honestly don't know. I don't know. I don't know. I know what the simulation MRI is for. I don't know how they use it, and I don't know what it shows. Does, does it? Maybe other people. I'll open this up in a second, but maybe other people know exactly what comes out of that simulation MRI. But I mean, you, you, if if you decide that you're going to go the the um, the radiation route, do, do you know where they're going to focus the radiation? Is it going to just be on your prostate, or are they going to radiate the whole pelvic girdle? Uh, he said they would do the prostate, they would do the metastasized spot, and they would do the lymph nodes in that area. Okay. So that, that would mean the whole pelvic girdle, uh, or it should do, it means they radiate you right across the hips, so they cover all of the lymph yep. nodes. Um, again, you know, there's some debate as to whether to do that or not to do that. I know that Steve did not have pelvic girdle radiation. <clears throat> the cat's, the problem is the cat's out the bag. And so right. is it worth radiating the lymph nodes and radiating right across the pelvic girdle when the cancer's already metastasized? And, and in, in Steve's case, he and his doctor decided it wasn't worth it. So these are these are conversations you you have to have with with your doc and determine what the downside is from radiating and decide whether you want to do it or you don't want to do it. Um, okay. Let me um, let, let me throw it open to some of the other guys. Is that let me the other guys? Is that let me? Is there anybody on the? Is there anybody on the? Oh, I'm getting... Yes, uh, I'm yes. Getting, this is Peter. I've got a couple of questions for Dave. Okay, go ahead, Peter. Dave, Hi, Peter. Uh, Hi, Peter. Dave, are you seeing uh, Dr. Eugene Kwan over at um, Mayo? Or somebody no, else? Dr. Davis. No, Dr. Dr. Davis. Davis. Dr. Davis. Dr. Davis. Okay. Let Great. Because I, I I've heard... Hold on, I've heard oh, Peter, Peter, hold on a second. Peter, hold on a second. We're, we're getting really bad feedback. And I think it's coming from I you, think Peter. It's coming from you. Okay, I've just closed my windows. I'm driving. That's why. Okay. Um, Is that any better? Any better? Um, no, I think you need to turn no, the volume down, you down because we down. are getting an echo. How about now? That's better. Any better? Yeah, no echo. That's better. A, a smaller echo. Okay. Yes. Keep turning the volume down a little bit, and you'll we'll lose the echo. How's that? Any better? I think so. Yes, better. Okay. Anyway, I've heard Dr. Dr. Kwan from Mayo speaking at uh, several conferences, and he's he's a pretty good expert. I think they've had great success in the kind of metastatic cancer you have with just a few spots. Um, I, my other curious question is. Is your is your uh, insurance covering proton therapy? Because I, I know a lot of guys, uh, their insurance doesn't cover proton beam therapy. I was wondering how, yep. how that works at Mayo. Yep, mine is covered. My wife works for Mayo, and so for whatever reason, it is covered. So I'm fortunate there. Very good. That's excellent. Um. 
has, is that we don't, do we have anyone on the call who has metastasized cancer who's debunked their um, prostate? We're still getting feedback. Um, no, I guess not. Um, you know, I, I, I think that if it was me today, um, I would probably want to get the primary, some treatment on the primary day, uh, just from what we're seeing and what we're hearing. Um, and if, um, you know, since you've had an orchiectomy, the, the, um, the ED is not an issue for you. So the question really becomes, what about the, um, the urinary side effects? Have you, have you ever had any urinary issues? Not to speak of, no. Okay. So if your urinary health is in good shape, I don't know that there is a lot of downside from considering um, surgery, considering radiation. Have you gotten any second opinions on treatment anywhere else? Well, I, not necessarily. I talked to different uh, radiation people about, you know, doing the conventional radiation and that. The people I know that have gone through that, it's been a struggle for them, and so I wasn't real sure how to do that. But when I heard about the proton thing and the research, that that seemed like that should be a pretty straightforward deal. But I don't well, know. You know, and I know I haven't really got a second opinion from all different a different well, groups. Else. So let me say that that I mean the proton beam is fine, but it's no better or worse in my own opinion, than any of the other modern radiation treatments, um, like the guided beam, um, the guided therapies uh, that, that, that they offer. Um, the only, there is a head-to-head -head study going on right now, but it hasn't been published. The only other head-to-head -head study I've seen suggests that you have more intestinal, gastrointestinal side effects with the proton beam and more rectal side effects with the IMRT. So, you know, a lot of people will sell the, the proton beam uh, as being the best thing since sliced bread. And then you'll hear all these people who have no side effects from it, but there are people that get side effects from it just as there are from the other. And there are people that sail through the IMRT and have no side effects as well. We just, because it's used so, so frequently, we just don't tap into them. But by and large, okay. I don't think that it's any better or any worse. It, it's certainly not the, the magic bullet that, that some of the proselytizers of proton beam would have you believe. But it's, there's nothing wrong with it. Um, uh, I think uh, the, the real issue is whether you want to... Uh, Peter, I've, I've um, excuse me a second. Peter, I've, I've muted you again because we're getting horrible feedback from you. I'll, I'll open it up if you, if you want to um, speak in a second. I think the, the, the real issue is whether you can tolerate the, how well you can tolerate the radiation, um, and whether you think that it, it, it it's going to help you significantly. I mean that the. the the one thing that is going to help you significantly, which if I were in your shoes, I would certainly be considering is chemotherapy, because we know that from the recent studies that have been done. That's going to give you the best chance of longevity um, over any other treatment for a man who was diagnosed with metastasized disease. Have your doctors talked to you about so, what they told me in Rochester was there were two two studies, one in America that didn't show any benefit to having chemo, and one in England that showed a benefit of maybe ten months longer life expectancy if chemo was used. 
Well, that's not the case. But I think they were talking about. Okay. Um, the, 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 there are several studies. The charted study, which is the American study, shows a benefit of, um, I have to look at it again, I think it's 18 months. It's between 18 and, and 22 months, and that's on average. The English study also showed significant. I can send you the studies afterwards, so you can, you can look that at That would be good. You can look at them yourself. All right. But, you know, the... What was the name of the study? Charted. C-H-A-A-R-T-E-D. Um, right. There are several studies. They, they have shown anywhere from 14 to 22 months in terms of benefit for men who are diagnosed with metastasized disease. And none of the other modern drugs that are being used um, have any um, they don't come close to that. So oh. I, I don't really know. I mean, one of the reasons I ask you is because male has a certain way in which they treat. They don't encourage prostate. They don't encourage chemotherapy for prostate cancer. They do encourage surgery and and, and radiation. Um, I have heard from Quan and and, and 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 others that if they recommend chemotherapy, they even send people out. But I think that yep, a friend of mine, a friend of mine, had done that, and he saw Quan, and he had a he sent him to a different facility to have it done. That's right. And, and yet they do do chemotherapy at Mayo, and so I really don't understand why Mayo takes that approach, why Quan doesn't use his inside people. I just think that that's not the way they like to treat prostate cancer, and I think that in this day and age where we're taking a completely different look at chemotherapy for prostate cancer, we recognize that it is no longer a treatment that is held at, till the very end and sometimes only used for palliative care, but it is a treatment that can provide significant benefit that I think if it were me, I would be asking for a second, I would be sitting with somebody, getting a second opinion and considering my best treatment path. And if if it were Any me, recommendations on yeah, yeah, where you go for a second opinion? Yeah, I do. Um, I I would go to um, to Bloom. Um, uh, what, what, I've lost his first name. Hold on a second, and I'll give it to you. Um, I would go to Bloom in 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 Minneapolis. Um, just bear with me, and I'll tell you his first name. Uh, we have a bunch of guys that use him. I can refer you to some local guys who have been with him for, for many years. Um, they like him a lot. He's, um, he's pretty much on the cutting edge in terms of his treatment. Uh, Stuart Bloom. And I'll send you his. Stuart, Stuart Bloom at Minnesota Oncology. And... And, and I will um, send you, you're in the car, but I'll send you his, um, his details afterwards. And, you know, then you can right. sit down with him and ask him. And then you just compare Davis and Bloom and you need some more. In, my, my own feeling is you need more, more input. Let me, let, me, um, let me throw it open again. Um, and see if anybody else would, 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 would like to add anything to that. Can, any, right. Guys, anybody on the call that would like to add something? Um, yeah, this is Jake. Um, Dave, I, everything, I agree with everything <clears throat> Rick said, but if you decide to go with radiation, and if you haven't done so already, you might want to ask your doctor about a, a treatment <clears throat> called space ore that protects the rectum during radiation. Um, I'm not sure exactly how it works and it's relatively new, but if you do decide to go with the radiation, uh, 
you know, after your second opinion, then you might want to certainly ask about that. Yeah, yeah this is Dennis. Uh, I just uh, got back from a conference this afternoon uh, listening to a uh, medical oncologist here in Tucson uh, talking about space ore. It's S-P-A-C-E-O-A-R, I guess it's two words. Uh, and he has been using it, and it's a process of using a hydrogel injected in between the rectum and the prostate to prevent the side effects to the rectum uh, from the radiation. Right, that's my okay, understanding. Okay, they did talk about that. That's one of the procedures they were going to start this week. Well, you probably should get the second opinion first, as Rick suggests. I agree. <clears throat> um, I don't know how quickly you can get in to see Stuart Bloom, but you can use um, you can use our name. You can use Rob Barniscus's name, who's an old um, who's a patient of his for many years. Uh, he's the guy I'd like you to to connect to, and I'll introduce you. I think he's camping for another couple of days, but he lives in um, Eden Prairie. And uh, okay. and he's a terrific guy. He, he's our, he's the treasurer. He's our Answer Cancer Foundation treasurer. Um, you can you can see him if you go to, um, what's the website? Well, if you go to our um, resource page, uh, or one of our pages, we've got videos, but he got a tremendous amount of time out of uh, Zytiga Avaratero. And uh, Jansen have made a couple of videos about him and his treatment and, and how he's managed. And so there are a number, we, we've got some posted on our site, we have some posted on our YouTube site. And, um, and then it's, I think the site is called My Prostate Cancer Roadmap. Is that right, guys? Does anybody? Anybody know? I I can't recall. Um, so um, I think it's my prostate cancer roadmap. Um, I'll look that up for you too, and just so you can get a sense of of, of Rob. But um, it, sometimes it, it, it's difficult to get a quick appointment with him. I think you just have to tell him that. You know, you've got metastasized prostate cancer. You're trying to figure out where to go next. The Mayo wants to do some treatment, and you need to get in quickly to get a second opinion, so that they'll give you an appointment yep. quickly. <clears throat> yeah, as hey, Dave, this, Dave, this is Peter again. Um, yep. Just commenting on the on the proton therapy. I I had a guy on our on my call a couple of weeks ago from uh, down in at, uh, Atlanta, and he had protein beam therapy in, in Nashville, I think, or Memphis, uh, recently. And it's, it's uh, the people that have done it seem to rave about it, as, as Rick said. It's almost like a cult unto itself. In fact, I got an email the other day about a, a, a cruise through the, um, the British Isles this summer uh, for just for proton uh, radiation <laughs> people. I mean, it's, and it's, you know, they expect about a thousand people on this boat um, cruising oh. the British Isles. You know, who who've gone through proton beam radiation. They're not all pro prostate cancer people, but it, as I said, it is almost a cult unto itself. And it's good to hear that Mayo's doing it, and it's covered by insurance because a lot of people have to pay out of pocket, and it can be thousands of dollars. But uh, yeah. it's it's gaining some traction and momentum, and I, we'd be curious if you go with that to hear more about it, because we don't have many guys on the call that, that go with proton therapy. Well, I won't be able to call from the cruise, so you'll have to wait till I get back. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think insurance covers the cruise. Oh, well. <clears throat> oh, my. hey, wait a minute. Maybe they maybe they got a proton machine on the boat for a top-up whilst you're well, that's what. That's exactly what I was thinking when he said there was a cruise. I'm like, wow, they got a machine. They're doing it on the cruise. <laughs> the perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Yep. 20 days, 20 day treatment, 20 day cruise. You, you, you pop down oh. to the basement for a quick, uh, 
for a quick session um, every morning. How about that? Wouldn't, wouldn't that be nice? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll send I'll send the cruise notification to Rick, and he can forward it on to you. <laughs> all right. Um, but you know, I think the bottom line on all of this is that. As I said before, it's probably not a bad idea to have radiation. Proton beam is, is great, and, and, and the other radiations are, are also just fine. What we don't find with the other methods of radiation is we don't find the people that are pushing them as hard. And, you know, when you talk to the people that have proton beam and you say to them, well, we just don't hear from all those people that have been happy with their radiation, they don't have much to say because, as Peter says, it's sort of if you if you have proton beam, you get involved with proton Bob and your and his website and and you know you and and the doctors want you to recommend it to other people because they've got a big nut that they have to uh, crack each month and the, you know it's got a very good word of mouth. It's got a very good social um, network. Uh, and w which a lot of the other forms don't have. But if you ask for comparative studies, um, which are not made by the radiologists that offer the proton beam, because I discount those, there really isn't much out there. I'll send you the one, yep. that I'll send you what we've got. I'm going to be sending you a lot of stuff. Uh, you're going to have a lot of homework from me, Dave. Wasn't such a good idea maybe to come on this call. Uh, right. Um, but no, we'll we'll send you we'll send you um, I'll send you some stuff for you for you to read. But it's not a bad. I'm not not discouraging you from doing it. I but what I am saying is, um, just look at the other options and and really take a very hard look at whether uh, chemotherapy early on is the right thing for you because you might find that you might just find that it is. Um, any anybody else want to talk about? Early chemotherapy? Uh, I'm the new guy. My name is Greg. I did not speak up earlier. I was helping my wife with something. My name is Greg Harrison. Oh, okay. And I'm from Wembley, Wembley, Texas. Wembley, Texas. Is that like Wembley in England? W-E-M-B-L-E-Y? No, no Wimberley. W-I-M-B-E-R-L-E-Y. Yeah, yeah, we're in the uh, hill country between San Antonio and, and Austin. Okay. Well, I am uh, fifth, fifth. Thank you. Fifty-eight-year-old white male was referred to the site by uh, another forum that I frequent. Um, I don't remember which of the three or four that I'm on, but somebody recommended the call. Uh, it's hard to find support um, in this area. There's not a lot of support options. As I'm not in the city, I, I, I don't want to drive far to, to have to have conversations about you know, the disease. So if I can just give you my background and what's going on with me, then I'd appreciate some, some feedback from the, the group. We, um, we, we, we would love to, Greg, but can we, can we just finish up with Dave and then we'll come right to Oh, you. yeah, sure. I'm sorry. Absolutely. Yep, absolutely. I just want to make sure, I just, I mean, we're almost done, but I just want to make sure that there's nobody, because there are a couple of guys on the call who have been through chemotherapy, and I would love um, if if they have anything to say about chemo, I mean, I, Dennis, your yes. your diagnosis was was metastasized, and and you chose to do chemotherapy early, did you not? Yes, I did. Uh, my my very first diagnosis, you know, getting the Gleason uh, nine from my biopsy. Um, I was it being tested PSA every year on a regular basis, and suddenly went up over four. And uh, so I triggered the uh, visit with my urologist, and uh, we found out with the uh, the biopsy that I had a nine, and then followed that up with uh, radiographic imaging, MRI, CT scans, whole body bone scans, found uh, five lesions, uh, mets in my lumbar spine, uh, one in my right femur, and both pelvic lymph nodes involved and uh, it, so they, the recommendation was chemo and uh, androgen deprivation therapy and I uh, started the 
the end of the ADT with uh, Firmagon and then switch to Lupron and then within I believe it was a week or two after starting on that uh, started my first chemo with Dostaxel and uh, went through the 18 week regimen. Uh, it was it was a rough period for me but uh, it took my my PSA from 16 uh, down to 0.66 and I'm now still uh, about let's see nine months after I've had three three months uh, PSA analysis done and I'm, I'm still below one it's very slowly increasing but uh, I feel that it was it was beneficial and um, I would recommend it I'm and I'm uh, I'm 71. And, and how many metastasized spots did you have? I have a total of six. Five in the lumbar spine okay. and one in the femur. Yep. And uh, and then both pelvic lymph nodes were involved too. And let me and let me ask you, Dennis, did you have any conversation at the time with Dr. Singh about maybe removing or having treatment directly to the prostate um, radiation yes yeah we, we we did but it was a it was basically it was a non-starter uh, because the the prescribed protocol for my situation at the time uh, was to start both the ADT and the chemo simultaneously mm-hmm uh, but that's that's the process that's been followed. That that schedule has been followed probably the last ten years or so, I think. But but now the very latest, there's some limited information that Rick had mentioned earlier uh, about the possibility of doing even for metastasized. Uh, the the very limited small trial, I think it was 20 people were involved where they did go in and do uh, either uh, prostatectomy and uh, or radiation on some of them uh, in advance and see that that has is, is been beneficial to some extent. Now, they don't know because it's not a long-term study, but I think they got mm -hmm. uh, a small percentage of the people had positive results after uh, was it 20 months, I think? Yeah, you're absolutely right. And I'm going to send that. I've had so much to tell you recently, but I'm going to send that study out because they use the cure word in there. I don't think it's the right word, but I'm going to exactly send that study out and we'll, we'll talk about it probably next next Monday. Um, it, it's another promising thing, but I think it, it, I'd agree it needs more study. Yeah. It's a very it's, small group. It's a small group. But the only thing I would just correct um, Dennis on is that this this uh, concept of using ADT and chemotherapy right up front is really something pretty new. I mean, it's really only been the last couple of years. Before that, um, chemo really wasn't used until you were um, clearly, clearly castrate resistant. And some doctors, even until you, you, you were symptomatic. Um, so you would see men going maybe five, six, seven years before they they had chemo. Um, I think that what we're seeing now is this early intervention of chemo, and it and it could have. We really still don't know how beneficial it is, but but in the studies, it showed anywhere from, as I say, about fourteen to twenty-two months with the different studies. I I don't know where key. I don't know where Mayo's coming up with their numbers that it, it, there was no benefit in the U.S. study and, and, and some benefit in the U.K. study. Um, that in 10 months, that's just not right. Um, those weren't the numbers. Um, so, um, Dave, that's, let, you know, we're, we're going to wrap it up for you right now unless there's anything real urgent. but. I will follow up. I've got a list of five or six things to send to you. I'll try and get them out to you tonight, and then you can, right. you know, we can we can exchange information by email, and um, 
Um, you know, if you want, we can talk. If you want to do some 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 personal navigation, um, I can do that with you. We we do ask though then that you you make a donation to the nonprofit. Um, right. Or alternatively, you'll just come back on like you know, and you'll review it with us all, which is just just fine. It just depends how much time you would like for yourself. Um, Rick, one, Rick, one question. Can I ask? Rick, can I ask one other question? Of course, Peter. Of course, Peter. Yeah, Dave. I, I, since we don't, we don't get many guys on the phone. Uh, I can't remember one that had an orchiectomy. And uh, can, can you tell us a little bit about what kind of side effects or what the experience is with that? I mean, do you have fatigue because of it? Uh, because of loss of testosterone and so forth. What, 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 what actually goes on in your experience? So the two things that I've noticed so far, I have hot flashes pretty frequently, sometimes one an hour, but not continuously all day long. I can have five or six of them in five or six hours. The other thing is uh, I think cognitively it's messing up my memory. A lot of times I just draw a blank, and I don't remember using having to do that in the past. Mm-hmm. But so far, the fatigue hasn't been really an issue. Interesting. Um, you know, okay. I, I, I just like to comment on that very briefly. I mean, in theory, the side effects should be no different to, to Lupron or to an agonist or, a, or an antagonist, any LHRH therapy, because it's just a different way of taking the testosterone out of your system. It's not. Um, a reversible way, which the others are reversible, this is not reversible. So um, all of the side effects that we anticipate from hormone therapy uh, using a, an LHRH drug should be replicated with an orchiectomy. The, um, I will also send you a link, Dave, to, our, to a hormone therapy pamphlet, which is a very good pamphlet, which will help you better understand the side effects of not having testosterone in your body. Um, the fatigue, unfortunately, or fortunately, whichever way you look at it, takes more time to, to kick in. So right. just like most of you who are on hormone therapy, um, you probably didn't notice the fatigue until you were maybe eight, nine months out, and then it starts to catch up with you because it takes a while for your body to adjust and become more anemic, and that's when you start to feel the f fatigue. One thing that um, I do know that men have done who have had an orchiectomy is that they have given, depending on the state of their disease, uh, considered doing testosterone boosts to give them the relief that uh, a man who just went off LHRH drugs would get. So, you know, as, as Peter well knows, you can take a holiday from your LHRH drug, you feel much better, um, and your testosterone returns. For a man who's had an orchiectomy, for the testosterone to return, you just get a testosterone shot. And that will give you the same relief and, in, and improvement in quality of life if that you if your doctor considers that you're a candidate for for intermittent therapy all right i wish i had known that beforehand well you know unfortunately i don't think people really um the reason we have this call is because you don't get the information you need from your doctors. Exactly. And, and you know, we always tell people. We've had people on the call who have talked about orchiectomies. We've said, yeah, it's fine. It works great, but it's not reversible, whereas the LHRH therapy is reversible, and that's why we, we tend to recommend it, because it isn't as, a, it isn't as permanent. Um, at the same time, if you put testosterone into your body to make you feel better and to give you the relief, um, then the only thing that you're not really 
um, able to restore his ED. Um, yep. And I don't even know if that's true, to be honest, with, because, you know, there are certain um, uh, penile implants that, could, that can be used, and they may even be effective, but I, I don't know enough. It starts to get a little be beyond my pay grade at that point in time, so I don't really want to talk to you. But I do know, if, if, if that were ever an issue, I do know people that you can talk to. All right. So let's let's move on to Greg. And Greg, we really do welcome you. And the whole reason we have this call, well, not the whole reason, but a big reason is because we just recognize there are a lot of men in remote places um, and they can't get to groups. And it, 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 the whole purpose of doing this is that we open up this exchange of knowledge to people like yourself. So. Please go ahead, tell us a little bit about your, your disease history. Greg? I'm sorry, I had you on mute. Oh, okay. Age 58. Yep. Um, uh, last PSA I had before I was diagnosed was a 3.4. And that was three years ago. And then last winter of uh, 2015, started experiencing some pretty severe back pain. I've always had back problems. I'm a pretty big guy. I played a lot of football when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. and I thought it was just more of the same and went to the chiropractor as usual practice. And he would give me one day of relief instead of a week of relief. And I'm like, uh, something's not right here. So I started doing some reading. I was like, you know, I better go see the urologist. I went and got a PSA full. That was February of 2016. And it came back 323. He didn't believe it and had me come back in for a retest two weeks later. It was up to 658. So um, he did a 12 needle biopsy. All 12 needles came back positive, nines and tens. I think four nines and eight tens. Mm -hmm. um, had went the next day or two days later and had. Uh, full body CT scan and a full body bone scan, a nuclear medicine bone scan, showed that I had uh, enlarged prostate. Um, they thought there was a benign growth in the bladder neck, um, but the biggest issue, there was lymph nodes that were involved, but they weren't too bad and they were close to the pelvis. But the, uh, the cancer had already spread throughout my entire skeleton from my feet to the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, they could they could see hot spots everywhere. Um, so uh, I did not have insurance at the time. I'm a consultant, and I was you know being brave and trying to forge through until I needed to get Obamacare. So it was of course right after open enrollment. So I started making some phone calls to local cancer operations and see who could help me. And I paid out of pocket so far for the the biopsy and meds and stuff. And joined Mike Scott's prostate cancer forum and he re recommended me to Dr. Ian Thompson down at CTRC at the University of Texas Health Center in San Antonio. Mm -hmm. So I called Dr. Thompson's people and they got me up with Dr. John Sarantopoulos, who's dynamite, I love him, he's a medical oncologist. Went and saw him a year ago today, uh, was my first visit. He put me on Kazadex day one. Um, went back four weeks later, he had dropped the PSA to 110. And then I got a, he put me on Dometa or Zoldronic acid for the bones uh, four weeks later. And then started Lupron four weeks after that. And then started my six rounds of chemo four weeks after that. Mm -hmm. That started in the middle of July. And by the time I started chemo, my PSA was down to about seven, just on the androgen deprivation therapy. Um, the PSA slowly crept down. By the time I was done, my last appointment for chemo was... October 31st, and it was I was down to 1.54. 1. 1. Um, he gave me seven weeks off. I went back in December to get his Omega infusion, and it was up to 3.4. Mm -hmm. Back in January for a Lupron shot, it was up to 7. Went back in February just for a four-week checkup, was up to 22. He put me back on Kazadex along with the Lupron. And I just went back last Monday, and now I'm at 44. So it doubled again. So it's doubled three of the last four months. Mm -hmm. 
So he came in, and I was getting my Zometa infusion on Monday, and the, and the MO actually walked into the chemo room and told me that, uh, that for now, for the next four weeks, to stay as is, and then what we'll discuss options um, and I, when I go see him in the end of May. My, I guess my biggest concern is, you know, it sounds like I'm already hormone resistant. If it's doubling, even on Kazadex and Lupron, then I got, you know, hormone issues. Right. Um, I feel generally pretty well. Um, uh, Zometa, you know, knocks me on my ass for about four or five days because it just goes right to the bones. And when it hits the marrow, it just, it's like a chemo infusion. It just knocks you for a loop for a couple mm-hmm. days. Um, today is the first day I've actually felt like a human since last Monday's infusion. But when I do feel well, I feel, you know, like I don't even have cancer. Um, even with a climbing PSA, I do get tired. But that's from lack of probably more activity and not lifting stuff. And, you know, the doc's recommending that I don't do a lot of exercising because you want to be careful of your bones. They're more brittle, blah, 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 blah. They are blastic uh, lesions in nature as opposed to the other type. Right. So it's a thickening as opposed to a thinning of the bone. Right. Um, but I, he had me do follow-up CT and bone scans in January. Yeah. And the CT scan came back. There was no soft tissue cancer evident anywhere. The lymph nodes that had been um, cancerous had basically just disappeared or got absorbed by fat. Um, the, the prostate had actually shrunken to a third of the size it was when I uh, when I got diagnosed. I can actually go a whole day or two now without taking a Flomax if I don't forget or if I run out. It doesn't like you know I'm not like every hour having to pee. Right. So obviously, there's been some help in the urinary issue, but um, my, my I guess my biggest concern is one of my best childhood friends passed in January. He pretty much had the same almost path that I did, except he had his prostate out about six years ago, and then he had right. recurrence. Right. And from day of recurrence, he went through chemo then, and then he he passed after like 18 months after he got you know re-diagnosed after it came back. So I guess my fear is. You know, at this point, what's next? Right. Let, let me let me just ask you um, a couple of questions. You mentioned the scans. Mm-hmm. When you did this January scan, was the had the had the bone mets um, increased, decreased, or looked pretty much the same as when it when was it? Uh, they, there was about four noticeable spots that had gotten a little more severe. Um, and I could have told you before I went in where they were, uh, my right hip, uh, my left pelvis, mm. left collarbone, and the back of my skull. I, those are places that I have almost constant pain. Mm-hmm. Um, even, you know, I'm on Norco, tens, taking about 30 to 40 milligrams a day. I try to keep it as low as I can just to be functional as a human being. Mm. Um, but, but I can't live without the, the pain meds, that's for sure. Right. Right, right, right. Um, and what was the what was the name of your Serentopoulos? Is that the name of your dog? Seren, yeah, John, John Serentopoulos, yes. And where is he? He's at the University of Texas Cancer Treatment and Research Center in San Antonio. Okay, yeah, UTSA, yeah, okay. And mm-hmm. is he, is, does he consider himself to be a specialized do you need a urinary medical oncologist, or is he a general med- medical oncologist? No, he is a specialized uh, genitorio, genitorio, uh medical oncologist. Okay. This is all he does. Okay, good, good. Um, well, again, you know, we'll, we'll sort of use the same thing. I'll give you a few ideas that, that, that I have, um, and then we'll throw it open because I think there's probably a bunch of guys who have had comparable situations. Um, I mean, I'm looking at Eric Bookbinder here, and um, I know Ron Shaheen's on the call, and, and, and a couple of other guys who are, are, have been through similar experience. I mean, it's definitely clear that your, um, your cancer's back. Uh, how did you tolerate the chemotherapy? You know, the, the first probably two infusions, um, I, I told, it was docetoxel, by the way. Um, right. Given over an hour, I guess it was, you know, however many liters it yep. is for body weight. Yeah, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I got six treatments, and my only the issues I had was probably day four and five after infusion were just train wrecks. But beyond that, mm-hmm. um, I tolerated it pretty well. I mean, I actually gained weight through chemotherapy. Who does that, you know? Um, but I found that if I ate, it, it stopped the nausea, and then I would just keep constantly snacking all the time just to keep the nausea away, right. and it worked. Okay. Um, and as far as, you know, my, I mean, I, I lost all my hair the first day, but it's come back thicker than it's ever been before right. I was partially bald. Um, no, I, I think I did real well, and I don't, you know, I don't know if he wants to go back down that road. I know I've talked to a couple of people on other forums that have lived in, like, Europe, and they've done 10 to 12 rounds of basotoxin. That's right. Um, you know, it, it obviously was effective on me since it took the PSA down so right. far. That's I'm just, right. I'm just wondering if he, wants to go, if he wants to go that route again, I'm all for it. Yeah, so, you know, my first thought was, well, you know, maybe you responded well to the docetaxel that um, discussed with him going back on the docetaxel. Uh, we know people, and I think, Ron, are you are you on the call with us right now? I'm, I'm there. Good, okay, because we can't see your face and all the hair that's grown back. <laughs> um, no, I, uh, how I many... avoided the... I avoided the video today. Okay, well, well, that's okay. We don't, you don't have to put it on. But I just want to. I know, I'm going to come to you in a minute, but I just want to give some ideas. But just let Greg know how many chemotherapies you've done. <laughs> I've done. Uh, I'm on my this Thursday. I'm on my fifteenth month. <laughs> okay. Wow. Yeah. So, and um, it was effective. I mean, I I was started on uh, docetaxel the first three, and it was not effective. And uh, mm-hmm. from the fourth on, I've been on cabazotaxel or Juftana. Um It took my PSA from 800 down to 149, and I've sort of plateaued there and gone up and down since. So, so you know, I think that um, definitely talking to Serentopoulos about um, going back on chemo, either a full dose of docetaxel, um, a slightly smaller dose of docetaxel, or Jeftana, Cabazitaxel, which is the second li- second round, um, has less side effects, is sometimes thought to be more effective, and is the drug that um, that Ron is on. Uh, that's certainly an option. And then you've got um, all of the newer hormone second line antiandrogens. The, the first issue there is, are you going to be receptive to them? And right. we don't know whether your what's called ARV7, androgen receptor variant 7, positive or negative. 35% of, of men, 30 to 35% of men are, are ARV7 positive. They don't do so well on either... Zytiga or enzalutamide, or, or, or um, Extandi, Avaradarone or enzalutamide. Um, and there is a test that's available, and we can help you, if, uh, but hopefully Serentopoulos knows about it, but there is a test that you can do. Some people say, why bother doing the test? Let's just take the drug, and if we respond, that's great, and if we don't respond, we know that we're ARV7 positive. The problem is that... Mm-hmm. Um, the medicines are expensive, and while right. you're clearly eligible for the medicine, uh, even with insurance, without insurance, it's going to cost you eight to ten grand a month. With insurance, it's probably going to still cost you a couple of grand a month. So some people say, "Look, well, the one, go ahead." The one, the one thing I've found that that this this place does that's amazing, and maybe because they've got such a is a large group of population of Hispanics that are less than insured there yeah that they've got great social workers they've got me actually my lupron and my zometa both have been free basically except for the infusion cost but uh right. the drug companies have been donating them well, so that's, that's great um, i've been I've, I've had to cut down on my work because i'm a consultant so i can't work as many hours as i used to so my right. you know my take home pays lower which helps right. me to qualify for their their program so that's not really an issue well, um, I, I definitely, um, I definitely would encourage you to um, consider whether you would like to 
whether you want to do this ARV7 test. It's done out of Johns Hopkins mm -hmm. right now. Um, in some instances, you can get it covered. In other instances, you can't. But, but discuss it with Serentopoulos before you start, before you enter into the, um, the financial maelstrom of, of uh, Zytiga or Xtandi. And there is a lot of ways to get subsidized on Zytiga and Xtandi. I'm sure your hospital will know them. We know them. We can help you. We can guide you. We have contacts. Um, I, I now have developed pretty good contacts for um, for Xandy. We have good contacts for the Zytiga people. But so the, the, the first option would be chemo. The second option would be the hormone therapy. Um, there's no reason why you shouldn't do ProBench right now. You're eligible for it, and it should be covered by your insurance. It certainly would be if you were on Medicare. Um, okay. and by the way, uh, it might be worth your while applying for disability SSDI right away. You don't have to take it, but you okay. have to be on SSDI for, I think it's 28 months to be eligible for Medicare. Oh, okay. And gotcha. what you might be able to do, because I was able to do this, I thank God didn't have metastasized disease, but I was still able to do this. I was able to backdate my eligibility. And that by doing so, I, I, I got an extra year um, from the date that I applied. They backdated it over a year. Now, the benefit of that, you, you know, you may not want to take any monetary payments, but right. you may be able to get onto Medicare much earlier, and that's going to be very helpful to you in terms of your, your, medical, your medical insurance. And with the, Absolutely. with the cancer that you have, you are, um, you are pre-qualified. You're a I forget the term now. I haven't used it. We haven't talked about this for a while. But you are um, pre-qualified, and you are a um, uh, an automatic approval. It takes approval. About six weeks. Okay. Because of the state. Because of the stage four. Because of the stage four. Yeah, and I can send that if you want it. I can send you some information on that that I've I've got bookmarked, but. Um, there are guys here that have done it, and it, 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 it's very helpful because you then become eligible for a bunch of decent programs. You can get yourself covered for probably around maximum a hundred to a couple of hundred dollars a month. In, in addition to um, in addition to to the to whatever Medicare charges you. Um, right. So you've got you've got to look at the ins and outs of that, but. The financial aspect of these second-line drugs is important. Provenge um, is also expensive, but it's definitely covered by Medicare, and it should be covered by your insurance. With you know, with your with, with the cancer coming back, that should not be mm -hmm. a, that shouldn't be a big issue for you. Um, and Provenge is Provenge is what now? The Provenge is a an immunotherapy where essentially what they will do is take your blood and out of that blood they will they will filter um, the white uh, blood cells and they will from them they will get to your dendritic cells which include the T cells and they infuse them with a, um, a certain compound and then they put that all back in and the T cells seek out the cancer and attract more T cells so that you are really mm. leveraging your own immune system. It, you don't necessarily see a um, reduction in your PSA because it doesn't so much kill off the cancer as it does encapsulate it and stop it from spreading. So it, 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 Awesome. It, it, it works in a different way, um, but there's a lot of information on, on, on Provenge, and that becomes another option. I can keep they, the, Now, he, 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 wouldn't do, he wouldn't do that at the same time he would do chemo, right? He would do chemo first and then the Provenge? Or? Yeah, I, I doubt that they would do it 
at the same time. Um, you could do one first and then the other, but the 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 the, the Provenge takes about six weeks. It's one treatment every okay. two weeks. Um, okay. And um, I don't know. I'm not sure. I, you'd have to ask him. I mean, I, we try not to give medical advice here. I can only tell you. No, I understand. No, I'm. Um, I'm, I'm just looking for options. But, I appreciate um, the feedback. I'm going to open this up because I know that there's a bunch of guys that want to talk to you. Um, and the other thing is the Zofigo, but you absolutely should not be doing Zofigo at the same time as chemotherapy. Zofigo is the radio act, the, the radium-223. Um, right. And if you have any sensitivity at all in your bone marrow, which it sounds like you do, um, I do. then I would defer the, the, the Zofigo. The only other thing I do want to say is I am, again, I'm not, we're not a doc, and we don't give medical advice, but I've never heard a doc discourage exercise for men with metastasized disease. It really surprises me. Even, even with bone men, we, what we tell here, guys here, and they do it, and they benefit from it is exercise but just be careful what it is and you do need to do weight resistant exercise and you do need to do aerobic exercise it will make you feel a hundred times better there are a bunch of guys who are going to tell you that on this call and and if you call in again and it strengthens your bones and i in the eight or nine years i've been doing this and i'm huge on exercise i don't think i've ever heard anybody who has said that the exercise has has been deleterious to their um, to their bone health, so I don't get that one at all. Um, okay. I just want to throw that out. Now we can even suggest to you a couple of bone, a couple of exercise plans that are designed for for, for, for men with with with, um, with metastasized cancer. So that'd be great. Anyway, let me. Um, let me throw it out, guys. Let me start with Ron Shaheen, who's decided to come and show us his face. <laughs> Hello. Well, you were making you were making uh, remarks about my hair, so I thought. Yeah. yeah. Well, I think Greg's on the telephone. I don't think he's on the internet, so he can't see yeah, that's, how your hair is. That's true. Yeah. Um, well, I don't have anything specific to tell Greg. Um, um, my experience with chemo um, has been rather mild obviously losing my hair, which we all expect. Um, I had very little nausea or no nausea. Um, I did have a little, ex uh, right at the beginning, um, I experienced uh, mild, what I would call neuropathy. Uh, the bottoms of my feet uh, became numb, and uh, it was not painful. It was a little annoying. Um, if, when I wore shoes, it was like uh, maybe I had some, some rounded pebbles in there. I was always trying to empty my shoes. Um, but uh, this last Wednesday, I woke up and had terrific pain in uh, my right foot and um, took a, a couple of days, couldn't even walk on my foot, it swole up, and uh, took some extra strength Tylenol, which did nothing, and I had some Norco left over from my bladder problem, <laughs> and um, uh, took uh, five milligrams of Norco three times a day, uh, six hours apart, and, and that was fine. I went to my regular GP at Kaiser, and uh, he confirmed that it was a, uh, you know, just an advanced case of neuropathy. Um, but uh, it's gone away. Uh, that was uh, Monday. Um, now everything is kind of back to normal. I have my, as I said, my 15th uh, infusion on Thursday. Um, PSA has still been going down. Uh, I'm at about 580 now. Um, over the last two and a half months, down from uh, close to 800 again. Um, my, my attitude when I started back on the chemo after a month and a half off uh, was that if it just slowed down the advancement of the cancer, I would be a ha happy guy. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, as it turned out, it actually uh, has been reducing the cancer again. So I'm still a happy guy. So that's my story. Okay. 
Who else would like? Who else would Thank like you. to talk to Greg? <clears throat> Greg, this is this is Peter. Uh, I also Peter. live in a remote place. I also live in a remote place, um, and I, I have a, I have, a, I have a good buddy who's about your age, also with metastatic cancer, and he he got caught in the insurance buying this one. Um, he he signed. We got him signed up for Medicare, but it doesn't. It, there is a 28 month waiting period, and so his Medicare is not going to kick in until September, and his COBRA insurance runs out next week. So he's uh, so he's on Obama. He's going to switch to Obamacare next week for five months, and the mm -hmm. doctors they're already putting them through the hoops, and it's it's a whole bunch of stress that nobody needs to go through. I mean, what's covered and what's not covered, and um, there's a lot of there's a lot of issues. So I would I would agree with Rick that you know you want to you want to try to get on to Medicare through their um, through their uh, through your diagnosis as soon as possible. And, uh, there's a long waiting list, but you want you want to get on it uh, because it's it's a lot better than. Uh, in, than the Obamacare issues or anything else that the, that the government might run up, run up in the next year or two. So I appreciate it. Uh, Thank it's, you. It's, it's a bunch of stress you don't need at this point. Just like my buddy. No, and I, have, I, I don't know about I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I have found that when I get stressed, it just makes you feel horrible. <laughs> I mean, it's <laughs> it, it, it should it, it's the yeah. worst part of this. Yeah. Another but, point. Another point on the uh, financial end of it. Uh, back when I was. Uh, on Zytega and Extandi, uh, which I failed. Um, but while I was on it, um, my uh, my share was about $2,500 a month um, from Kaiser. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I found this, this group called PAN, Patients Advocate Network, P-A-N, Patients Advocate Network. Um, mm -hmm. And they, um, they have a website, and you can actually do a one-page uh, um, uh, test or what? Not a test, but just a, a clearance um, on their on their website, and um, within uh, three or four minutes before you finish it, they will leave, they will tell you 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 qualify or not for their assistance, and um, um, you know they gave me uh, eleven thousand uh, dollars right off the bat, and the qualifications had nothing to do with um, any. Uh, investment income or anything it was just I was retired I was on Medicare and that was about it um, mm -hmm. I, it was interesting uh, after I did some research of these guys I asked them uh, where they got their funding and they got their funding he said from a lot of companies that uh, you know uh, offer them money but with uh, extra um, digging I found out they were supported by uh, the companies that make Zytega and Extandi, right? And uh, they give them money. They get a write-off for the money. Uh, we turn around and buy the drugs at retail, and they win on both ends. But regardless, <laughs> uh, doesn't yeah. matter. So exactly. It doesn't matter. Uh, I just, would suggest if you're on any of these expensive drugs, you might check them out. So let, let me just intervene on that one. Um, there are government regulations that have prevented the farmers from funding PAN now for the last couple of years. Ah. And um, that program is now run through us too. Um, and it was open about a month, two months ago. In fact, it, I put it in one of our letters. Somebody maybe remembers when. We had two or three guys that applied immediately and were eligible. I honestly have no idea if they still have money or they don't. But until you actually um, are prescribed the drug, Greg, I, I don't think you could even access them. I could send you the information right now, but but you're not on any treatment where you need their you need their um, assistance. You'd have to wait until mm, you need right. assistance. Okay. But um, okay. when when you're ready, we can certainly connect you. But it, it's just touch and go. Eric, Mr. Bookbinder, you does does Greg's story sound at all familiar to you? And 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 even though you're a you're a man that doesn't produce any PSA, the the treatment path may sound a little similar. 
Well, um, unfortunately, I'm now joining the ranks of those who produce PSA. My test on um, Monday came out 15. So, um, uh, I uh, consulted with Dr. Agarwal about that already, and um, I'm going to see Larry Fong on uh, Wednesday, week from tomorrow. Wow. That's great, because Larry is not seeing new patients. Yeah, I, I, I'm using that as a generalized statement. It's Larry Fong's group, so I don't really know who I'm going to okay. see. Well, we'll talk about that again, but let, let's focus a little bit on what help you can or words of wisdom you can offer to Greg? Well, you know, certainly the, the um, uh, trial that I'm on, you know, I, I had a very similar um, trajectory, uh, but um, the trial drug I'm on, you know, has seemingly kept the cancer in check. So for almost 10 months now, I've had no more metastases and no more growth. Um, Unfortunately, the PSA keeps going up. So um, I don't know, but if, you know, if I had you know I had failed Expandy and and Casadex and um, was looking for something and went to uh, UCSF and uh, this is what they put me on. And for, as I say, for almost ten months now, it's it has uh, kept the cancer in check. It uh, wow, cure, but it's but it's you know it's. It's of the same nature as Xfandi and Casadex, except it seems to be a super drug that um, is working when those two have failed. What was it called? It, it's, it only has a number now. GS for Gilead, 5829. GS 5829. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Yeah, and they, they still are taking new patients into the phase two study. I was in a phase one, and, and I'm still on the drug, but um, I... Uh, was in the waiting room with someone who was just starting a month ago um, on the phase two. So um, you know, it's it's a possibility. There, it's not it's not only UCSF. Um, you can look it up on the government um, database, and it tells you um, the universities or or the places, uh, hospitals that are are um, participating in the study. Yeah, but I I think, yeah, much. I think you may have to have failed enzalutamide or or abiraterone first. Yes. So, and, and... Well, not entirely, because, well, I, I don't know what they're doing now. The phase one study, uh, half the people were doing, taking it with ensalutamide. Okay. And because I had already had it and failed it, I was in the group that was taking it without ensalutamide. Okay. So, you know, it raises a really good point, Greg, which, which we haven't discussed, that, you know, there are other options related to, um, Clinical trial, clinical trials, and for somebody yep. that has not taken abiraterone or enzalutamide, you may have options open to you that those guys who have already been on one of those drugs don't have. So you need to. That's a, yeah, that's what I'm gonna talk to Mark Docker about too, because he runs clinicals out of his his shop down there at UT also. So right. I'll see what he's got going on. Right, 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 right. Absolutely. Anyone else like to like to speak to? Um, to Greg, before we, we, we're going to leave ourselves about half an hour to just go around everybody. It's going to be a quickie today, I'm afraid. But anybody else want to say anything quickly to Greg before we move on? Yeah, this is Dennis. Uh, one quick thing outside of uh, the drugs and the treatment and so forth, um, I had a very similar comment made to me about the exercise issue uh, because of my bones, my, my mess, and my That's lumbar right. spine. I, I've been playing golf right along uh, 18 holes twice a week, and uh, I was told when I went for my second opinion after I had all my radiology stuff done uh, to define my the extent of my disease, uh, I went up to Mayo Clinic and got a second opinion, and uh, the oncologist, two oncologists there said I should stop playing golf because of my bone and the risk of uh, spinal cord compression. And mm -hmm. I, I went out on my own and had a bone density scan done mm -hmm. at a woman's imaging center. This is, right. this is what a lot of women do for when they have osteoporosis. Just, and they right. will tell you the exact uh, 
strength of your bones from in a, in a range, you know, is it normal, is it weak, is it, you know, strong, or whatever. And um, after that, and then consulting uh, with my oncologist with the results, because they came back mostly normal uh, mm -hmm. density of my bones and my oncologist. So I asked him, I said, can I play golf? Do I need to put a brace on or anything? Said, you don't need no brace. You can keep playing golf. So <laughs> I resumed playing my golf, which was, was a big thing for me. So it's, Well, uh, it is for me, too, because that's, that's kind of one of the things that I've lost, not be able to play. Yeah. <laughs> Was, so the in the bone density, you know, they wouldn't pay for it, but it's only like two hundred dollars. Well, I'm gonna get I'm gonna go get one done, and I'm gonna take it with me to my next appointment. Well, I could. I, I, and let, let me just I say that that I don't understand why they wouldn't, and I think if you know if you appeal, they will because every man going on long term bone de and long term hormone therapy, a bone density test is part of the protocol. Exactly. Is it really? It, it is, yeah, because because we know that hormone therapy weakens the bones. And I, I had this done when they put me on hormone therapy, and I turned out that I was osteoporotic, and I you could have knocked me over with a feather. And um, has anybody else has anybody else gone through the Zometa or Zoltronic acid? Oh yeah, I mean I I did it, I did it, but only once a year because I didn't have metastasis. But um, yeah, we've got. Who else has done Zometa on the call? Yeah, I have, Ron Shaheen, yeah. Right, and Eric? Right. Now, the one thing with the Zometa, how often are you getting it, Greg? Every 13 weeks. Okay. Okay, because um, some guys get it every six weeks, and the recent study said that three months is as good as six weeks, but your guy's on top of that, so that's fine. Yeah. Well, that's yeah, funny because when I originally was, his PA was the first one, and well, actually his intern was the first one that recommended it, and then she brought in the chief oncologist because my guy was off that day, and he said, "Oh no, not every four weeks, every thirteen weeks." I mean, he he changed their mind just like that. Both right. things quick. Right, so. right. We know that. Um, yeah, and it has a hell of a long half life, so if you have any reason to stop it for a while, it's not such a bad thing. And then you can go back, and then you can go back on it, um, guys. I, we've got to move on because I want to give ourselves half an hour at least to go around everybody. Um, well, thanks everybody for the feedback. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a you. pleasure. And um, Greg, if you're comfortable, either you can take my email address or, um, and send me yours, or you can give it me over the phone. But we'll add you to the um, we'll add you to the distribution so that you you know ahead of time every time we have a meeting we send out a note um sure um let me let, let me go ahead and give you a moment over the phone it's my last name harrison h-a-r-r-i-s-o-n yeah and then r-e-o yeah and then consulting so that's all one word harrison reo consulting at gmail.com uh -huh. you, that you don't, that's not re consulting is it or it, it's not um it's no not, it's for real estate real estate. For, for, for real estate it is owned real estate uh -huh. uh, owned real estate yep like foreclosed properties yeah so i was responsible for disposing of all of chase's owned real estate from 19 1990 to 94 95 one of my uh, one of my top clients right now in Miami is uh, one of their lead asset managers. How about that, and he's still working for JPM. Yep. Who is it? Doing the doing the exact same thing. Twenty four asset guys named Eddie San Roman uh, in Miami. Well, we'll, we'll, we'll talk because uh, because yeah. uh, we, we we have a lot in common. So it's uh, sorry, Harrison Ari. Wait a minute, I can't hear you. I have earphones on. What? It, it's Harrison. Yes. Uh, Hold on a second. Let me just. Let me just. Uh, what? Let me just. Yes. Uh, there. I just. I just muted Ron. Um, Harrison Ario Consulting at Gmail. Did you say? Yes, sir. Okay. All right. I'll send you a note and you know, my telephone number in there. We 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 can talk about the REO world. I know it very well. Yeah. Yeah. We can. Cool. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you. <laughs> um. All right, let me do a quick rundown of um, 
of who I know is on the call, and there are a couple of people that have joined it. So the people I see, I think Rebecca Dahl has now left us, uh, Dennis Correa, Peter Kafka, Ron Shaheen, Jake Hannum, Tom Van Zandt, Paul Frieda, I think Greg just left us. Anybody else who has joined whose name I haven't called out? Yeah, Eric. Well, I thought I got you. Sorry. Um, Mike Tamales. Sorry, who was that last one? Mike Tamales. Mike Tamales. Oh, were you on the call when we were talking about you? Um, um, a little, well, if you were talking about the, um, the enzalutamide, um, I was. <laughs> no, we were we were talking about your insurance woes and and having oh, yeah. on in Obamacare. Peter was talking about that. Yeah, <laughs> no, yeah, I've, I've been on there since that. You should have piped up. You should have said that's me. We didn't know. Oh, um, a little mouth. Yeah, um, um, it's supposed to be in place as of May first, so we'll okay. see. Okay. So um, let me just run down and see. Um, Dennis, is there anything you'd like to raise tonight? Uh, no, uh, just I have an appointment tomorrow to see my supportive care doctor uh, mm -hmm. at the University of Arizona Cancer Center. Mm -hmm. Again, you know, I, the, the value of getting treatment from a, a cancer center like that where you have all these other services uh, sure is nice. So I get a, to talk with her about some of my uh, stiffness in my joints and stuff, Absolutely. which I, I, and maybe there might be some massage or acupuncture or something like that that I can get for that. Yeah, stuff. absolutely. And you know, we tell guys so often get a palliative care doc on your team early. I mean, they call it at U of A, at University of Arizona, they call it supportive care. At, at UCSF, they call it symptom management. So they use a lot of um, euphemisms for it, but it's, you know, it comes under palliative care. It does not mean end of life. And they are great docs more often than not. And uh, they can do all kinds of, they have all kinds of magic tricks in their bag. And we just really urge you all to get a, palliative care doc on your team as early as you can. Agreed, Dennis? I agree totally. <laughs> she helped me right, right through uh, chemo and all that kind of stuff. Uh, they also had a full-time dietitian on staff that right. I was able to consult, consult with her and uh, help me through my stuff so I didn't get nausea and maintain my weight uh, properly and that type of thing. Okay. Uh, Peter, anything for you that you'd like to raise? No, no I'm good tonight. Good, okay. Um, Ron, Shaheen, are you still with us? Oh, wait a minute. Hold on, Ron. It's my fault. I, 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 um, I muted you when you were talking to your wife, but I don't see you now anyway. So you may have you may have uh, hung up. Maybe his wife had a honey do list for him. Um, Jake, anything for you? Um, only if there's time, Rick. No, good. Okay. Only if there's time. Only if there's time. Okay, got you. Um, Tom Van Zandt. Oh, are you all? Oh, there he is. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm okay. You're okay? All right, okay. Every time I look at you, it looks like that mustache is gone, but I think it's just the lighting. It's gone totally white is where it's gone. Oh, that's what the problem is, okay. Um, Paul Frieda, anything for you tonight? Well, um, yeah, I'm kind of curious. Um, okay. uh, right now, I'm on. Uh, I'll come back to you. I'll come back to you. Um, Eric, anything for you? 
Oh, I kind of went over it already. Okay. Um, we'll, but we'll come back to it because of Larry if we've got a t time. Mike Tamales, anything for you? Uh, if you got a couple minutes. Yeah, we will. I think we will. Um, and anybody I've missed? All right. So let's let's start with um, with Paul Frieda. Go ahead, Paul. Well, I'm just uh, curious. I was wondering if we could have a little a short discussion on. Um, you know, I'm on Lupron, and it's about a year and a half, and sooner or later it's going to fail. And it's in, it seems to me that once the Lupron fails, there's a bewildering choice of options that that are that are available. And I'm wondering the, what's the um, what's a um, a good way to think about all of them. You know, there's there's Provenge and there's trials and there's AR uh, genetic testing and there's Xtandi and there's you know I mean there's so many different options. I'm just wondering if there's a way to kind of um, bring it into focus as to um, what you know what what the sequence might be recommended these days. So it's, I mean, for example, for example, you could you could you could say once you fail Lupron, you try either Xtandi or Abiraterone, okay, and uh, and you see if you fail that. But before you do that, you probably should have I think it's the ARV test to, to see whether it's likely that they're going to help, right? So I'm just I, I've you know listening you know I, I attend um, most of these and there's so many. Uh, you know, options, uh, I'm kind of um, bewildered. And sooner or later, you know, one day I'm going to have my blood test and it's going to show my PSA is rising. And all of a sudden I'm confronted with all these choices. And I was wondering if there was, um, you know, if, if we could have a little discussion about what typically should be done once your Lupron fails. Right, right. I mean, interestingly enough, I got an email from a guy with the same question. And, um, and I think it is probably worthwhile speaking to and probably when we've got a little more time than we than we have today right um, yeah I but the um, the, the one thing that I said to this guy and I will say to you is that provided your PSA is not going crazy um, I mean you don't have a situation like Greg had where it's going up by large amounts each month, significantly large amounts each month. You have time. And to worry about that when you're doing well, on the one hand, it sort of makes you feel better because you know where you're going. On the other hand, it stresses you. And that's really what I'd like to throw out to the group. I mean. Does the group think it's a good idea to worry about what you're going to do next when your disease is under control? Well, no, I don't think waiting to the last last minute is a good idea. I mean, and and there's nothing that causes stress more than uncertainty, you know. But if you know that that there are um, these tip, you know, these are the the most recommended options uh, at at different stages, then uh, you know, then at least you have you know you, you know what forest you're going to be walking into. Uh, when the time comes, and the time is going to come. I mean, it's it, you know, Lupron isn't just going to last forever. I'm with Gleason 8, and it's unlikely that I'm just going to be on Lupron for the next 10 years. Sooner or later, I'm going to get a blood test that's uh, bad news, you know. And But but you raise a very good point. You, we probably do have time, unless you're very unusual, and your PSA is, you know, rising really, really rapidly. But I guess the first thing you might do is once you fail, then all of a sudden, instead of getting it every three months, you should be testing every month. Or maybe even more often to, to gauge the uh, the aggressiveness of the of your cancer. Let's hear what <laughs> some of the with your guys. oncology. Let, hold on a second. Let's hear what some of the other guys want want to say. Peter, the floor is yours. Have you had Have you had this discussion with your oncologist? I've certainly had it with mine, and I have a good feeling for what their thoughts are. Uh, you probably. If you don't have a good oncologist, you want to find one who, who will speak to you about this kind of stuff and what their plans are. Well, I, you know, I think all oncologists have their, um, um, you know, their limitations, and and so they know what they typically can and will do, and so you're going to get, you know, sort of a, a colored view of what the possibilities are. Like, for example, I did mention to my oncologist about the ARV7 test, and he said, oh, we don't do that. You know, it's like he... 
you know, he almost wasn't aware of it and he didn't want to really talk about it. So I've got to be, you know, I've got to do my, you know, my due diligence so that I'm more on top of it than my, you know, if I had, if I was going to MSKK, you know, then I know I've got the best in the world and then I can just, you know, and uh, listen to what they have to say, but I don't, I don't think I have the best in the world. I think he's very good, but I don't, you know, I, I, I want, I want to be more prepared than he is, if that's possible. So, what, what do other guys think on that? Uh, what, what, I'd like to hear what other people think. Yeah, this is Dennis again, and uh, this is a significant issue for me. Uh, my oncologist keeps telling me, and I think I told you, my, my PSA has gone up the last three uh, intervals that I've had it tested, uh, but I'm still below one. And, uh, you know, technically that is uh, castrate-resistant metastatic. And uh, he is telling me, you're doing great. You're doing great, and, and, and keep enjoying your life, doing what you're doing. You know, uh, it, it, that's easy to say. Uh, but this thing, this is, you know, I, I, I agree. I know what the, what the future holds, but you don't know when uh, it's going to happen. So it's, it's hard to just say, just, just live your life every day and don't think about it. <laughs> it's easy to say, but it's difficult to do. So, you know, that's another thing I might want to discuss with my supportive care uh, physician is to think that I can do uh, uh, to help myself get through that point. Mm -hmm. um, the other thing is just I would like to know if there's, you know, my, my reason for being on this call basically is is the window to the world here. What What is developing uh, as the next options uh, when I get the failure of my Lupron? Uh, so I have those things in mind uh, and follow the, the, uh, the testing that's being done on those. Any, anyone else want to chime in on this one? Um, this is Jake. Uh, you know, it, it depends, you know, as Dennis says, you know, eventually you're, uh, I think it was Dennis, eventually Lupron's going to fail. Um, even though you have to be going to be on it the rest of your life, most likely anyway. Um, and once it does, you're going to become metastatic uh, or castrate resistant, not necessarily metastatic. Um, and it's not curable. You know, there still is no cure at this point other than radiation and surgery. So every everything that we try, you know, Lupron, Abiraterone, Extandi, Radium, you know, all of those things are going to extend our lives, but they're not going to cure us. So my philosophy is stretch it out as far as, stretch each one out as far as you can before you go to the next one. And that's a philosophy my, my uh, oncologist and I kind of agree on. <clears throat> it's not right for everybody. Um, you know, it's easy to panic as soon as your PSA starts going up. But, you know, if you try everything, eventually you're going to run out of options. And that's not a good place to be at either. So that's my take on things, for what it's worth. Thank you. And I guess what I would say, Paul, is that you have to look at the situation at the time that your PSA starts to go up. So if at that time there are bone mats and they find bone mats, I think for me, it would be pretty clear that I would want to do chemotherapy because that's where I see the biggest bang for your buck right now. It may be, it may have significant side effects. Um, it may be very manageable. We've heard a couple of guys on the call tonight who manage it well. We there are plenty of guys on this call who tonight who have not managed it well but it delivers a big bang for the buck. Whether they would give you chemo before you had bone mets very much depends on, 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 on your doctor. We know that there are several, several second line antiandrogens, but who knows what will be available. Maybe by the time you're, you start to get castrate resistant, the drug that Ericsson now might be available as another alternative to enzalutamide and abiraterone. So to start thinking about what should I do now, should I do the Abby, should I do the ENDS, you know, am I um, 
do, do I have an androgen receptor variant or not? It has to be deferred until the point in time that you want to get the testing and looking at the drugs that, that are available. How about immunotherapy? Well, in many cases, immunotherapy is complementary to anything else that you're doing. So why not go out and, and get Provenge as soon as you're eligible? Three successive increases. But by the time you come to the Provenge, maybe Prospac is going to be available and you just get one injection because Prospac is going to be an alternative to Provenge. So when I say to you, let's not think about it, what I'm really saying is you don't know the right thing to do until the situation arises. As long as you're aware of all of the options, the actual strategy of which one to go to is going to become evident when that PSA starts to rise. And you know, for every every guy, it might be different. If you're a if you're an ABC man, anything but chemo, then you're not going to. You, it doesn't matter how much I tell you I would do chemo. You're not going to do chemo. So it. it it's all well and good saying, well, you know, I, I, I want to get all my ducks lined up in a row so I know exactly what to do when my PSA starts to rise. But we don't know what's going to be available for you when your PSA starts to rise. No, I understand that. I understand that. They're, you know, you're open to anything and the field is changing quickly. But I don't want to just rely on, you know, I don't want to just say, I trust my doctor, I'm going to do what he says. I, you know, I have friends who... That's their attitude about doctors, and I've had enough bad experiences with doctors to know that they're human, and, and I want to make sure that I'm on top of it so that I make the best decisions possible all, all along the line. So I want to prepare beforehand. I don't want to wait until I'm sitting in my oncologist's office and I discover he doesn't know anything about Prospect, you know, something like that. Okay, so, so, uh, so how do you prepare beforehand? Uh, just uh, this way, exactly. I exactly talk to what you're other. doing. That's right. Exactly. You know, that's why. That's why I raised it up. I wanted to. You know, I, I learned. I learned something every time I listen to this call. I hear something I never heard before. Something is interesting, and there's something that could extend my life by days, weeks, or months, uh, sometime in the future. And so, you know, one of the gifts this call, you know, this uh, this forum it gives to us is the access to a lot of information from a lot of different places. And there's no better way to get informed than by talking to an awful lot of people and then making your own judgment after you've heard everybody right. talk. Exactly. And we will revisit this conversation um, because I, I hear that it's an issue and, you know, when the time is right within the next couple of months or three months, we'll, I'll, I'll, I'll make a note that we need to revisit it and because it's an issue for enough men, um, but it's also an issue that doesn't have a clear answer it just has no. It doesn't have one. Doesn't have one, one answer. Doesn't have one answer for sure. But you know, when you see all the cards on the table, then you can make your own decision. Yeah, exactly. Um, and right. I think when I'm saying what I'm when I'm saying to you, don't worry about what you're going to do. I'm not saying to you, don't keep yourself well informed. Keep yourself right, well informed, right. but don't drive yourself nuts about which is the right one for you, because we won't know which the right one for you is until it actually happens. That's that's my point. Exactly. I understand that completely. And I, it's not that I'm worried. It's just that I want to prepare beforehand. You know, okay. uh, success is uh, in anything uh, is is really really done long before the event happens. When you're really prepared, and then um, you have the best chance to you know to uh, be successful at what you're trying to do. Okay. So anyway, I, I you know I'm I just um, interested in hearing other people's opinions about the the variety of options there are. And um, you know, like for example, I have an invest investigated clinical trials at all yet, and I probably should be at some point at least up on it so I know what to do when it's uh, something that should be an option for me. So. Yeah, and you know, that's a good point, and I think you should be familiar with how to use the clinicaltrials.gov site and various other sites that might point you to clinical trials. Um, interestingly enough, Renata has just been asked to participate in a trial, in a panel, I think it's next week, this week or next week talking about the issues around clinical trials. She's written something in the Philadelphia Inquirer, one of her articles, if you Google her name and... and um, um, What's her name? It's, uh, she's, the, she's our moderator for our caregivers call, Renata Lowers, L-O-U-W-E-R-S, L-O-U-W-E-R-S. 
first name Renata. Oh yeah, I've, I've seen her name, yes. And she moderates our caregivers call. Um, she writes fairly frequently in the Philadelphia Inquirer. Google her or I'll try and find it for you and send it to you. Um, and 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 read what she she said, and we'll we'll talk about. We need to we need to have a special session on clinical trials or something. I'm going to just move on quickly, Eric. The best thing is I think since it's really um, very specific, I'll give you a call when we hang up, and we'll talk about phones if that's okay. Okay, um, Mike Tamales, tell us what's on your mind. Um, well, you guys pretty much covered what I was, what I wanted to talk about. Um, um, Paul actually brought it up, and uh, you know, when these medicines fail, where you know, where do you go from there? And and uh, I got a pretty good idea about what you know what's going to go from there. Um, my um, my doctor uh, prescribed me Xtandi, um, ended up getting neuropathy in my legs, um, uh, which has decreased a little bit over time, but I still have it. Um, uh, as you know, I'm changing insurances. I went over there with the card to show them the new card so I can get everything lined up and what do they do but give me an, um, prescription for Xtandi again. And um, I'm waiting for the doctor to call me later on this afternoon to, to see does he want me to take it or does he want, does he did not want me to take it. Um, I got a, an appointment with him on the 28th. Um, but uh, he was supposed to call me this afternoon. I don't know if he will or not, but um, I, I think uh, what we've gone over the last few um, minutes has pretty much answered what I what, what's been on my mind. So I, I really don't have. Mike, let, let me ask you a couple of questions. First of all, what are the problems with the, with with Xtandi that are encouraging you? Or persuading you not to continue with it. Oh, my 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 feet feel like they're not there. Okay, so it's neuropathy. And then then and then, and then, it, then it starts crawling up my leg, and then it it, it then I'm like a um, a stumbling bum. Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, so no, it's just my my legs are my legs get really weak, and and uh, right. yes. So it's the neuropathy. It's really the neuropathy that's the big issue. And I is Peter going to go with you on this week to to your appointment? Yeah, I believe so. Yes. Yeah. So you know you'll focus in on the neuropathy, and see what ideas he has. Some guys have found a lot of benefit from um, from acupuncture. That might be something that you can look at. I don't know. I don't know what's available on Maui. Um, yeah. But you know, you certainly talk to him in terms of what you're going to do next. I know I sound like a broken record. You got to get your tumor sequence. Got to get your tumor sequence. And um, I, I think you, they sent off the liquid biopsy and nothing showed. Isn't that right? Yeah. And how long ago? Was that? He also did. He also did the the the, uh, the added sequence from the original um, original biopsy of the uh, of the prostate as well. He showed on that either. Okay, so the lick, so the so but the liquid biopsy was done how long ago, Peter? About a year ago. Well, I mean, I I would say do a, here's something that I learned, and I stand corrected, and 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 eat humble pie um, on the call. I, I wanted to talk about it, but we haven't had time. But I did speak to Foundation Medicine. And most of the um, actionable genes are 
included in the liquid biopsy, but not all of them. There are a couple of extras like the ATM gene, just like the ATM with the, the money that spits out the money, the ATM gene, which is not. But um, what Foundation Medicine told me was, even though the panel is much larger, you're not going to find a lot more actionable genes out of it. So if nothing else, um, just do another liquid biopsy and send it off, um, or a solid tumor biopsy, and let's make sure you don't have any actionable genes showing up. Right. Well, this is this is this is only our second appointment with a new oncologist, so we have brought it up, and we'll we'll continue. It'll be interesting to see what his take is on whether to continue to expand it or not on now on right. this Friday. And and like I say, um, speak to him about the neuropathy. You know, it's yes, we for sure will. We have a lot of questions for this, this appointment. Thanks, Peter. Anybody else want to talk to Mike about where he's at? Okay. Um, I guess, did anybody join us towards the ends of the call? I see a couple of people on the phone call, uh, by phone, who haven't identified. Is there anyone new on the, who would like to say hello to us? Okay. Uh, well, Paul Hobson from Melbourne has joined, but doesn't doesn't want to say anything. <laughs> <laughs> Paul Hobson from Melbourne, how dare you not want to say anything? Because we always want to say to you, we hope you're feeling good, and we hope that life is tolerable. Always, life life, life is to tolerable, especially for the encouragement from you guys. Thank. Listen, um, since you're on the line, I did something, and I don't want to get my knuckles wrapped, but I'm glad that you're on the line. But you had a guy on your advanced cancer forum who um, was talking about recently diagnosed and had gone through chemo and was having difficulty maintaining his exercise. And I wrote on there, told him about Dr. Steve and how he won a tennis tournament in the middle of his chemo and had a worse initial diagnosis. And we invited him to participate in this call. I hope that's okay with you guys. I mean, we're not trying to get in in, in, in front of your call, but we just wanted him to know we're here if he would like to join us. Not, 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 not a problem if we had any problems with your your post, it would have vanished by now. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know what? We've got a couple of people on this side of the water who you could give some instruction to, if you like, because we've been having issues. Oh, I'm, 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 aware, of, I'm aware of those issues. Okay. Um, that bloke you're talking about, I think, was wanting um, to find out about human growth hormone for yes. cyclists. Yes, yeah. Uh, which I don't think in, any of us know about, and he suggested he might contact Lance Armstrong if he wants to go down that <laughs> that route. It's possibly a good idea. Well, you know, the one person who might know something about it is Dr. Steve, and since he's also the guy that did so well on chemo um, in terms of his exercise. I thought that you know if this guy shows up, maybe we can connect him to Dr. Steve. That was my that was my thought. Yeah, well, look, you you've given him the offer and leave it up to him. Absolutely, absolutely. We won't go further. Hey, how are you managing on that blue scooter? Oh, it's it's, it's a black arm chair. Oh, black arm um, chair. Okay. No, go, go, going well with it. Okay, well, you need to send us a picture so we can put it on our Facebook and our website. Okay, will do. Thank you very much. Right, Jake, as soon as you get that picture, right onto Facebook, Mr. Hobson. Just make sure you get the picture the right way around. Don't post it with the wheels up in the air and the head down. Right, because he's, he's from the land down under. That's gotcha. Right. You got it. Okay. <laughs> 
we like to we, we you know how the Brits like to tease him, but he gets his own he gets his own back on me often enough, so that's okay. All right, guys. Um, it's five after five or five after eight, wherever you are, and um, I don't know what time it is in Australia. I give up when it's tomorrow. Um, but um, welcome. But you're you know we we, we had a couple of new guys and. Um, I think that we've given them a lot of information. I'm sorry we didn't have as much time as normal for uh, the regular crew, but I'm sure you understand and, and you'll bear with us. The, the next meeting is going to be on Monday. I will probably be doing that from somewhere down in Tucson. I have no idea where, but I will find an internet connection and, and I'll be on the call. And um, that's it for tonight. So I'll say good night to you all. Good night. Good, thank, good night. Thank thanks, you, everyone. Good travels. Thank you. Good night. Good night, good night, good night everyone. Good night. Thank you, Rick. Good night, guys. Oh, uh, Eric, stay on. Stay on. Everybody else. Everybody else is gone. Jake, Jake can, doesn't matter. Jake will go when he wants to go or he'll stay. There you go. Jake's gone. So stay on and, and let, let's talk for a minute. Um, so All right. Well, my wife doesn't know this yet. Gail is sitting right here and she hasn't heard yet. Oh, okay. So give Gail the report and then we'll talk. Yeah. PSA 14.8. So, um... I already wrote to Agarwal, and um, he said that he and I will talk after my meeting with uh, Larry Fong's new group. Somebody named Eric called me from his group. I don't know who that is. So um, they were, um, you know, they were very uh, responsive, and I thought, you know, that was. You know, so often it's hard to get into these things, but uh, they called me, you know, they, I talked to Dr. Agarwal, and on my way home, they called me, so, um, you know, they could even have seen me today, except I had a conflicting appointment, so I could, tomorrow, rather. So, I will see them next week, and, uh, who? Uh, it's the immunotherapy group. Oh, okay. So, so I, um, I, don't... I don't know what to do there but uh. yeah I mean I don't know enough about how he's structuring his new group unfortunately I didn't get the chance to talk to him on Thursday and I actually wrote him a note and um, and he reply he always replies right away and um, so it, it, you'll help me by telling me what, how how they process you he is not taking he's not taking regular prostate cancer patients so i don't exactly know how the focus is and what qualifies you so one thing i can tell you is he's the best he's the best medical oncologist that i've ever encountered and specifically genito urinary but even beyond that He's, yeah. I don't know if you noticed, but um, uh, Dr. Lin is part of his group. Is that right? Yeah. So she switched over? Yep. So, um, well, look, you know, he must, he must think something good of her. Yeah, and he knows, uh, he and I have talked about, about, off the record, about how disappointed I was. And um, he knows that. And uh, whatever. Yeah, well, I told you the last time, first time I saw her, I thought she was great. And then the last time I saw her, she was kind of distracted, and you know, I was almost not there. Mm -hmm. So. Do they have a website? Does Larry's new group have a website? Not that I know of yet. I'll find out though. Um, so how did you know that a Amy Lim was part of his? group where did you see that um where did i see it 
I don't remember if it was in the literature from the symposium or um, somewhere else. I may have seen it online. I'll have, I'll have to figure that out, but mm -hmm. I know that I, I definitely saw it. I think it was in literature in the, from the symposium, but okay, um, not, I have that. Not to worry. For the way out. Um, I mean, to the extent that you can get and see him directly, he's the best. I don't know what else to say. He's the best both in terms of how smart he is and in terms of how compassionate he is. He's just, you know, he's got the best bedside manner and he's just super smart. And just be, okay. sure, and be, be sure to mention to him that you and I have been working together for the last two or three years. Um, Fair enough. So, um, if you... If you know that you're going to see him specifically, give me a heads up and I'll send him a note. Okay. Um, uh, so yeah, they're uh, up on Parnassus. I guess I guess they're going to build them a building, but for now they're they're back on Parnassus. Right. So look, here's the thing, and and it's 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 way overdue. You need. You need a current genome sequencing because they sequenced you on your old tumor, if I remember correctly. Well, I'll find out tomorrow, but in theory, um, Dr. Dolezal had the liquid biopsy done, or the liquid sequencing. So, um, and I see her tomorrow, so I'll certainly ask what, what happened to those results. When was that? Oh, uh, God, it's got to have been six weeks, eight weeks ago. Oh, okay. I didn't realize it was that recent. Um, yeah. And she was, yeah, having, was the last time And she was having that processed by Foundation Act, or she was sending it somewhere else? She said they do it. So, if, she, if they do it, then you need her to physically give you a list of the panel. So we can see how. Yeah, I will. I'll ask you for all the details. Yeah, I mean, we need to see how that panel compares. Actually, so I, I know what it, she does. They don't do it, but they have a connection with. I she didn't. She said who did it. The name didn't mean anything to me. And she said that um, they get it done for free. Is what she told me from whatever group it was. Please. And I don't think it was Foundation One. I don't know who it was. Could it have been gone? Well, I'll find out tomorrow and all the details. All right, you'll let me know. I'll see you on Friday. I'll have it. I was just going to say, on Friday, you can fill me in. Um, I mean, what what, what um, Trey Regallo told me on the phone was that really it's only the ATM gene that is not covered right now on their um, liquid biopsy. And that's, but, but what my concern is, is that there are a lot of genes in the pathways. So if you've got, say, the BRCA gene, which obviously is, not obviously, but the BRCA gene for sure is covered. You've got all kinds of genes that are in the pathway of the BRCA gene. And I just don't know whether they cover all of those little genes that are in the pathway. So like Dominic was, God rest his soul, was, had a variant in CDK12, which was in the BRCA pathway. So I and I that's that's what concerns me, and I still don't have a good answer. The person who's going to tell you whether they do or they don't is Larry, because I've had. Yeah, okay, so I got I got I looked it up online, and, and my appointment is with somebody named Gabriel Manis. Don't know them. M a M a double n i s. Yes. So I'll see, I mean, I'll try and take a look later tonight um, on um, on who these guys are. But if there's any way, I'm going gonna, I'll, I'll, I'm gonna to write to Larry. I'll write to Larry tonight, and I'll see if he's willing to see you. Okay, great. Okay. I'll tell him that he's yeah. just gotten referred by Agarwal to your group. And I'll let him know there's a relationship, and I'll ask him if he would be good enough. Should he see Gabriel Manis, or w would he be good enough to, to take you on? Okay? Okay. 
Absolutely. You know, and if he needs to, needs to change the time or date, I'm open. Okay. When's your appointment for right now? Wednesday at 11 a.m. at 400 Parnassus. So uh, when, Wednesday, Wednesday the third. Uh, Wednesday 5-3 at 11 a.m. Okay. Let me see if I can get if I can get Larry to see. I can't promise it will be up to him, but I'll pi I'm, I'll no. pitch him. I'll pitch him right now. Um, you need you need that you need good sequencing is what you need. And I've set, been saying this for a while, you know, because they're, they're looking now to see what drugs they can give you that have been approved that will act on your cancer. That's exactly what they're looking for. And, you know, God yeah. willing, we're going to find an actionable gene in there. And that's why they, it makes sense for Agarwal to have done what he's done. Okay. All right, boss. Um, I'll see you. Don't uh, think you have enough boxes? Say that. You have enough packing boxes? Oh, thank you for reminding me. Um, I'm right on the cusp. I will know. I, I, I'll let you know. By what time on Friday do I need to let you know? I'll let you know tomorrow night. I'll email you tomorrow night. Okay. I'm really. Yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm as they as they say, I'm getting down to the short strokes here, and um, and I'm getting kind of tight. So uh, I I'm just about ready to start my wardrobe boxes, um, but I may need two or three more on Friday um, to fill on Friday night. So uh, I'll I'll definitely let you know, and and you know. Do you have all sizes, or are they all sort of medium? Or uh, I don't have any wardrobe boxes. But no, except I... for that, I have what they call small, medium, and large. Oh, okay. See, I have ten wardrobe boxes. I have too many, so I'm going to be able to get rid of some wardrobe boxes. Um, okay. But I may need small, medium, or large. But if you have all three, I'll, I can give you an idea of what what I'll need. Probably be small or okay. medium. Um, all right. So. All right. Well, listen. I'm I'm really glad that you're going you're going into Larry's group because I have so much confidence in him. He's the best. Yeah. He really is. I mean, I don't know what sense you got of him when he was speaking on the, on the panel. Yeah. No. Absolutely. Like you could you could get got that feeling from when he was on the panel and speaking. You know. I mean, I it's hard for me because I know him so well, and I'm really fond of him, and he he's He's the best. He's the best, and um, and I'm just thrilled that you're with his group. And I will see if there's any way that I'll send him a note. I'll blind copy you on the note, and um, I'll do it right away. I've got to. Well, I've got to. I've got to. Well, maybe not. I've got to run out to do something before six o'clock. But I'll do it as soon as I come back. Okay. All right. I'll let you know then. Thanks All right. a lot. Bye. Right. Bye, Gail. Bye-bye.